Thank you. Should we call the guys? Hey, Larry. Hey, Matt, how are you? Good, how are you doing? Very good, thank you. Thanks for uh, doing the shoot. No problem. Do right, mind if I sit here? Yeah, I would. Oh, hi, bad. MSN's 2000. Started with a cane. The manual wheelchair. Power wheelchair, and now I can't move anything below my neck. After I was diagnosed, I let go from my job. I went on some experimental drug, drug programs that just made me seem worse, tired, feeling nausea, and I was sticking needles in my body every few, few days. The rebev, the avanags I went through, those drug trials, and it just felt, what a scam. You know, what's going on? Why? Why isn't it, why isn't it doing anything? They have so many millions and millions of dollars. Where does it go? What do they do with it? There's no, nothing to show. Just help me, man. You have to be incredibly tough to fight multiple sclerosis. It's like you've got your worst enemy inside you. I had the overwhelming feeling that life was over and there was nothing worth living for anymore. Uh, my legs went numb and I went basically blind. My only knowledge of MS was Richard Pryor. I was like, game over. This is on the rise. Many MS patients are holding out hope that a medication will be found. This is what it looks like. A million and a half don't even know that they have it right now. It's a ticking time bomb. MS is a disease where the immune system goes astray and thinks that the brain and spinal cord shouldn't be there and try and attack it. 
It's a long needle that goes into your muscle. I take Tizabri, Copaxone, Salsa, Gabapentin, yeah, Medrol. I get these jolts of electrical pain. Producer, director, Matt Embry was diagnosed with multiple sclerosis. We believe there's about a half a million people in the United States, maybe over two million people in the world. I'm young. I've just had a baby. How can I have MS? Multiple sclerosis remains a mystery. No cure exists. I've got one of the most insidious chronic diseases on this planet. we got to stop the lies about illnesses like this and start telling the truth. How much higher can the states be? It's billions and billions of dollars. And yet, the system is set up in such a way that it can be corrupted easily. I was like shaking and crying as I felt so vulnerable. All of a sudden, I get a phone call from my brother that Matt had been diagnosed with multiple sclerosis. And I mean, I literally almost collapsed. I mean, I couldn't believe it. You really didn't have any idea at all until that one day he said, I think I had a stroke. And we said, what? You know, he said, oh, I got, you know, I just got all this numbness and sensitivity on my side and everything. And I knew very, 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 very little about multiple sclerosis, except they were sort of bad. I was a nurse before, so it had a huge influence on my image of MS. It was tough that first few weeks with Matthew, because I think all of us didn't know what to say to each other. We were all just pretty shocked and pretty d devastated. It was so bizarre to have this feeling that, you know, my older, you know, athletic brother was fairly quickly going to degenerate and be in a wheelchair. It's always a pretty crushing stigmatism around it that just, you have MS and you're done, right? When we got the word, it's like someone would punch me in the gut. And I really thought it was kind of a death sentence. And so I, I'll have to admit, I broke down. I mean, I started to cry and, and uh, it's just like, here's my nephew in the prime of his life and being handed up a death sentence. Pretty devastating. I knew it affects your whole family, and to watch a loved one's body deteriorate in their mind, I think is the probably the most brutal thing that um, can happen to a parent and to also the person that, that has MS. Sorry. Sorry. You don't want that for anybody. from an international perspective. It's, it's very beautiful to you right now with the trees. And yeah. Not that we want to make postcards, but... Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's, it's really... Okay, I'm George Evers, and uh, I'm a neurologist and uh, MS researcher. aunt died of MS, age 30. I never knew her, but uh, that had some influence on me because I thought, well, if there's a, some genetic component that might be relevant to our own family. I remember thinking, there's so many clues, you know, this should take me about a weekend to sort out. Did a lot of reading about it, and uh, it's taken longer than a weekend. MS has all the things that make life difficult, I mean, in terms of for solution. You, no matter what question that's been asked in MS, you hardly ever get a black and white answer. It's, a, you know, sort of shades of, shades of gray. The things that are thought to be important are early life exposures like infections, probably some aspects of diet. Sunshine exposure, and the likely mediator there is vitamin D. And then there are other things which are random triggers. The first part of the disease seems to be autoimmune and inflammatory mediated, but the second part is what matters. The second part is what disables people. The second part is what accounts for most of the grief. First part's treatable, second part doesn't seem to be.
This is the bad part. Inject it slowly. Count to ten. I hate this part. Slow. Pharmaceutical industry, they would argue that they're not giving any false hope. What they're doing is they're saying that this drug will do this, 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 and this, which has been shown. So if you look, it says it reduces the attack rate by 30%, 50%, right? But when you ask them, okay, well, does it make any difference in the time it would take for me to reach a wheelchair or in the time it took me to develop secondary progressive disease, they'll concede they don't have any evidence for that. So if people get this progressive thing happening, then there's no evidence that any treatment actually makes that better or prevents it from getting worse. So when someone comes along and says, we've shown that there are fewer wheelchairs required or there are fewer people needing cancer on, I'll be pleased and satisfied. Haven't seen it. I unfortunately have tried five of the six FDA approved medicines, all of which were unsuccessful in slowing my disease. I have hope that the research that's being conducted is going to be successful. We keep saying the word long-term progression, long-term progression, like natural course of disease. It's just like, and I just can't help but think, it's like, hey, once the switch got turned on, yeah, I caught it. Am I fighting it? Yeah, I'm fighting it, but it's just like, once that switch is on, it's just like, it's just a countdown. And I just have this wave of just like, like it's just nothing more than like, just staving off the inevitable. There's John Plaxton, who's your great, great grandfather. You see, he was born in 1846, and I was born in 1946. Okay, so he's great, great grandfather. So who built it? He built this. Yeah, thing. My, he created my, this tomb. Yeah, and, like, yeah. The, and then the he just kept putting them in as they died, until they filled it up with six bodies. He's the one who made all the money. My brother said when he died, he was worth in today's money 50 million. Well, I always saw, you see, money doesn't buy happiness. No. Because I saw this family. Yeah. They all had tons of money, and they just they drank, and they just... It wasn't a happy family. No, just disaster. So that was the best thing I ever learned. Money and happiness have a very, very low correlation. Nothing has changed yeah. my mind on that. Yeah. It'll build you a big tomb that you feel creepy about. <laughs> yeah. You and Mom don't have plots or anything like that, do you? No. no. I said, I'm going to scatter my ashes to the winds of the Arctic. All right. I'm going to get somebody to haul him up there. Yeah, I'll do it. <laughs> I had assumed for some reason, oh, yeah, I'm sure they have uh, drugs, and I'm sure they have a way of dealing with this. And when the doctor said, no, there's no drugs, there's, we can't, there's nothing we can do. And we just have to hope. Well, that... Then that really was the time I really sit in. This is a real serious problem. And so immediately your mind starts saying, okay, there has to be, I have to try and figure out what the, what the heck's going on. Doctor. How do you do, man? Good. Nice to see you. Thanks for doing this. All right, our pleasure. Thanks. 
truthfully, I thought you guys were just kind of scam. If it might be a scam if you weren't talking to someone who's been doing brain surgery, right. legitimate brain surgery right. for 23 years with an impeccable reputation. I have a lot to lose if this uh, if I were looked at that way. Our model MS patient, the last time she was able to walk without a walker was 10 years ago. So she came to us for stem cells. I mean, we believe that stem cells can hone in on, on areas of damage, find them selectively, and repair them, and uh, regenerate them, hopefully. You need to repair the damage that's been done by your own body. I think stem cell work should start with your own stem cells, you being the pharmaceutical industry, you are the factory. The stem cells are taken from the patient's own abdominal fat. So the patient comes in, gets the uh, liposuction, and an hour later, the cells are ready to be implanted into the brain. And what happened? We uh, agreed to treat her. She fit the criteria, and uh, she had her first stem cells implanted back in May of uh, 2014, and she's had a miraculous recovery. She started with a walker, being able to walk one inch at a time. Most recently, she's walking without any limitation, and she walks at least 25 feet in one minute. She's making an amazing progress, and word is she's driving a car now. Hello. Do you want us to come in this way? The MS patient is suffering every day. <clears throat> After 10 years, my eye, I just felt my legs kind of felt weak. And uh, I felt that many times. If you live by yourself, just like me, you felt that nobody, nobody help you. Just like if I, if I fell down, I just sit on the floor for a few minutes, rest, relax the muscle, and then use all my energy to get up. Mm -hmm. A few months later, I, I felt I couldn't control my legs, and I took the beta zero. Later on, I go to Copaso, so I do the Thai separate, but I took around two years. Seems not working for me, so I just I talk to my neurologist. Maybe I I'll go for stem cells, and but my neurologist said stem cell therapy is not approved by FDA for MS. But uh, you have to pay yourself if you find it. So I just. Just go ahead and do the stem cell therapy. After taking the stem cell therapy, the second day I felt my legs, my feet are warm. Like in the morning, I, I, I felt uh, much more energy, much more strength. I can, I, I can just, just stand up. And then you're still driving, you're still driving yourself still, to the clinic. Yeah. Before the stem cells, I couldn't control my legs. It's, it's it's kind of, I, I just felt it's kind of dangerous to drive. But after the stem cells, if I have a good day, I'll, of course I will drive. I'll go ahead and drive. Do I think stem cells can reverse a, a patient who's had already the damage done? In my opinion, the, the, the potential is there, especially with what we've seen already with, you know, a few of our patients. It's extremely optimistic for me. I, I, I love what we're seeing. What I'm hoping to do is to have a larger 
study. We just need some financial support would be great um, so that, so that the, there would be no out-of-pocket expense for the patient. Shouldn't there be significant industry interest in this? You would think so. Um, yes, I would think there would be significant industry interest in moving forward with this, but where the industry wants to go is produce a drug in the form of a stem cell, right? So uh, a drug in the form of a stem cell is a stem cell that's been altered, a stem cell that's been induced, and that becomes their product. So there is a, you know, incentive for them to create that product and then get FDA approval to use that product, and then it becomes their product. Right now, the product that, that we use is the patient's product. They're the production factory. And furthermore, are these stem cells going to create a monster? That is the, the big question. And so we just need to follow up and see how these patients do. Well, thank you so much for doing this. Oh, thank you so much. But uh, of course, I hope that this treatment will long, last longer. Because yeah. if wait for ODA, it will wait forever. OK. All right, we're going to do it, OK? OK, thank you. OK. Thank you. Thank you. I knew what I was walking into. I don't mind talking. It's easier to talk to doctors and specialists and, and that when you're like looking right in the eye of it. That's the darkness, right? That's the viciousness of the disease, right? I mean, that's tough, right? I and mean, we're like the same age and everything. It's just like, Jesus. I leave just feeling sick. Like I leave feeling like I have symptoms. I leave feeling like I'm going downhill. Should we call the guys? But you know, that's like for me, it's like the that's like the dark place you fear, right? That's the that's that one bedroom studio apartment on the ground floor. Huh. You call? That just breaks your heart, right? You hear that story? She falls down, like no one's gonna pick her up. It's just like, gosh. Man, I mean, everything in me just wants to be like, yo, you. <laughs> like, you gotta come with us, you know? You just see that desperation, right? It's just like, fuck. You want it, you want to help, but he's like, what can I fucking do here, right? Good, how are you doing? Good. Hey, Matt, good to hey. see you, honey. Traveler, you've been all over the world. Yes, yeah, so it's been a pretty good it's run. It's been everywhere. Yeah. Well, come on in, come on in. Come on in. Welcome, on, welcome. I better turn off my screen. There's some spoilers on the, I'm just right There's the some of House of Cards card spoilers on spoilers. there, so, yeah. yeah. Oh, well. <laughs> <laughs> it doesn't warrant a response, but if the president or first lady. Eventually, when that's all done, then I orchestrate it. Uh, it's amazing. Awesome. Pretty cool, isn't it? It's a fun job. I love it, you know? That's great. How are you you're feeling good? Yeah. Well, I've pretty much been stable for quite a few years. So. Since yeah. diagnosis yeah. nine years ago. Yeah. Wow. So this is where Jeff does all his recording, and he leaves it set up. Um, you know, he can he manages the orchestra right from here. He conducts and he runs the film and right. you know, yeah, which has really been great because we get an orchestra in here and you know, the players love coming out here. It's kind of like a vacation. And what happened? How did you know? 
Yeah, it was a flare. I mean, it was a real, you know, I mean, the same thing. It was actually the numbness thing. Started in the arm, went down to the leg, and by the time I got back from, I was actually in Austin at a film festival. By the time I got back, it's like, man, this something's amazing. I got to get this checked out and have an MRI, and boom, there, there it is, you know. The early years especially were very kind of terrifying in the sense that, you know, my, our son was still quite young at the time, so I'm a dad, I've got a career, I'm a husband. And I had a lot of uncertainty about what I was going to be able to continue doing because, you know, one of the first things you learn about MS is there's a lot of uncertainty in terms of the type of course it's going to take, you know. I mean, I have friends in their 30s that are in wheelchairs. We met in college and got married in college, so this is my best friend. And seeing him suffering and feeling helpless, I wanted to figure out how to help him. That was my number one goal. And so that's why I started digging into research, because I think you were going to say, your neurologist really didn't give us anything concrete. It was just, well, we don't know what this disease is. It's incurable. You have it. Good luck. And, and she actually said to him, you know, do everything you want to do now, because his prognosis as a man with the kind of presentation he had was not good. So that's when I got serious about learning what this disease was and reading the research. I started reading PubMed, and I kept coming up with um, a lot of vascular connections. And when Dr. Zamboni's research was published, I sent it to Dr. John Cook at Stanford, who had been my contact there. And I just had him read it. And I said, do you think there's anything here? And he gave it to his colleague, Michael Dake. I, of course, had never heard anything about it, was completely sort of perplexed. It sounded kind of outlandish and a little left field, you know. It goes against a lot of dogma and a lot of uh, what we believe to be true in, in practice of, of treatment of MS. And I am not a neurologist. I am not an MS doctor. But I've been always open to, to, to listening to these things, and we talked about it and sort of held together as a pathophysiological uh, response that we see in other parts of the body. Many places of the body, we deal with venous narrowing, whether it's the legs, the liver, the kidneys, and we're very comfortable with that. We never thought about, could there be similar venous narrowings in the neck that might affect the brain? Why wouldn't there be? You know, Mike Dake said, well, let's just look at Jeff, right? Let's just look and see what's going on. We studied him with magnetic resonance imaging and lo and behold, what we saw was identical to what was being seen by Dr. Paolo Zamboni. The pictures were almost superimposable. So indeed, he did have venous narrowing of a significant degree. And again, this was sort of to us kind of almost shocking. I mean, how could this, you know, we never heard of this, and yet here it was identical in this first patient to what was shown overseas. It was real. <laughs> His jugular veins were completely closed off. I mean, we could see that on the MRV, and there was collateral circulation. And as Dr. Dake said, you know, I treat this. This was the first time I had talked to a doctor, really, since I was diagnosed, when they actually saw something, and they felt like somebody told me, looked me in the eye, and says, well, I can do something about that. When I did go up to Stanford and had the, uh, the stents put in, um, you know, uh, it was, I was, I, it was almost as if somebody turned on the lights. It was very strange. <laughs> and it's even strange to talk about it now because it was so palpable. But, you know, because you're awake during this procedure, and it's almost like as the blood started rushing into my brain, I was like, <laughs> I felt like awake again. And it was so wonderful. He's now out six or seven years and, and doing very well. It wasn't just him. You started looking at other patients, too. Well, we started to examine patients. Uh, you know, this community is a very tight-knit community of patients, and they are networked in a very tight way. So all of a sudden, a number of patients were coming to us without any, we were not soliciting in any way. And we started looking at patients, and we found a very high preponderance of patients with similar venous narrowings. And we started treating patients, and uh, we saw very interesting results. So how many patients did you treat? 
Well, it's a long time ago now. We have not been really treating patients for three or four years now. But with MS, I think we probably treated uh, approximately 59 patients. And they all had an area in the vein? Not every single one. Uh, I think there were two patients that we did not treat because they did not have what we felt was significant narrowing. And where, where, where is it today? What's happened? Well, right now, I think at least the interventional treatment of CCSVI has basically gone to zero. So why, why have you stopped? Well, the pressure, I think, from all sorts of various uh, special interest groups has sort of conspired to stop everything, at least in our country, and I'm sure in Canada as well. I, I'm well known in a certain specialty, not neurology, certainly not even MS. I was doing this because we were very interested and thought this was terribly exciting. But I had many people come up to me at national and international meetings and say, just watch yourself, watch yourself. You don't want your career destroyed by this. You know, you don't want your reputation, which is so good, to get sullied by, you know, associating with this sort of stuff. They thought it was complete hogwash. They thought it was uh, obviously did not have any basis in scientific. And unfortunately, therefore, we couldn't get funding to do the type of trials that were necessary to legitimize it. I'm not going to bash anything to do with the pharmacologic industry, but these drugs, as they come out, obviously, uh, are fairly expensive. What we're talking about for treating, our current treatments for narrowed veins are done by clinically undifferentiated products. A balloon is a balloon is a balloon. That's a low budget item. And as such, uh, there's not a lot of money to be made by industry as opposed to pharmacologically with the latest, greatest new drug. It'll get there. And all this is good stuff, you know, it's just not, in the time frame or with the accelerated tempo we might like. Like I say, it'll take another generation. Uh, you know, I came in there, like my expectation was that we have the answers. I just can't get them out there. No, that's not the case. Like, we don't have answers. We have some theories and to treat it, uh, it's gonna be a long time. Now, are they chasing it a different way than the current pharmaceuticals and neurologists? Yes. Do I think it's more hopeful in the long run? Yes, I do believe that. But I don't have time. I don't have time. And neither do anyone else with MS. So it's like from now on for the doc, like, fuck it, man. Like, going back, talking to the doctors, oh, we're going to hear the same kind of thing. What we got to do is tell the story of get out there and start doing different therapies that may have a positive effect on you because you got to try to stop it now. Because if you wait and sit back and hope that science is going to catch up and the doctors are going to catch up, you're going to die, man. Matt, come on in. You all will thank you. Five, four, three, two. Well, MS is a disease that affects... Uh, thousands of uh, Canadians. In fact, some of the highest rates are right here in Saskatchewan. Matt Embry is one of those people who suffers from MS. Matt from Calgary, and he's embarked on a speaking tour to uh, share his story on how he's uh, treating the disease. Matt, thank you so much for, for joining us today. Yeah, thank you so much for having me. It's great to be here. You're talking about how you're treating the disease. It's been 20 years since you were diagnosed with MS. Yeah. Tell us a little bit about how you're coping. Right, so in 1995, I was 19 years old and was diagnosed with multiple sclerosis. Yeah, well, it's, this is 20, 20 years ago, so I'm having a little hard time remembering exact, you know, but I just remember saying, okay, you know, what is this? All of a sudden, I get a phone call uh... I think he was about 18 or 19 that, from my brother that he had been diagnosed with multiple sclerosis. And I mean, I literally almost collapsed. I mean, I couldn't believe it. It was so bizarre to have this feeling that, you know, my older, you know, athletic brother was fairly quickly going to degenerate and be in a wheelchair. Well, it was definitely tough. I mean, you definitely have like a cloud come over the entire house. So I mean, there was a pretty crushing stigmatism around it that just, you have MS and you're done, right? 
I was a nurse before. So it had a huge influence on my image of MS. It was absolutely terrifying. Sorry, sorry. You don't want that for anybody. I had assumed for some reason, oh yeah, I'm sure they have a drugs and I'm sure they have a way of dealing with this. And when the doctor said, no, there's no drugs, there's nothing we can do. And so immediately your mind starts saying, okay, I have to try and figure out what the, what the heck's going on. He more just dug right into the science. I mean, like it, we largely hit the ground running where like his office just became stacks of papers and just there was something new every day in terms of like the research or what to do. And my brother is an astounding guy, like he's a PhD in geology, but I mean, he's one of the great researchers and he just beavers in on a subject of, it, of great interest to him. And obviously this was a tremendous interest to him because of his son's issue. So he went to work and did, he researched every aspect of this and he settled on diet. Science is it all. And to me, you got to have hard science. That's it. In terms of an illness, well, you want to treat cause. And I thought with the dietary th therapies, we were treating cause. He basically got Matt on a very rigorous diet, as I'd sometimes joked with Matt. Maybe the diet's worse than the disease, but it worked. I just remember the months where we just sort of ate broiled chicken or broiled fish. <laughs> like, and that was it, like, that was, or, and like vegetables, like it was really cut down to nothing and then sort of built it back up. If they had had a drug said, okay, this drug, you take this drug, then you'll be absolutely fine for sure. Then we probably would have gone on it. You know, that, you know, I'm a believer in drugs that actually are effective. When he was diagnosed, he had a fairly it's a very serious case, and I mean, as a result of what he's done subsequently, it's worked fantastically, and I mean, look at him. I mean, the guy looks like an all-star, and he's been afflicted with it for more than 20 years. And then after I'd done my research at the start, and I'd put it all in a, put it all in a paper, and. And I decided I should give it to the MS Society of Canada and say, oh, look, I found this information. And I, I wondered if they'd be interested in distributing to their members. And I was very surprised when they just were not interested at all. Why, why wouldn't they want this information? That was my first inkling that something was not good. Well, MS is, is this mysterious entity, and I think that there hasn't been progress in terms of knowledge about the cause or the cure, since basically the diagnosis was created by Charcot back in the late 19th century, mid 19th century so that it's up to the MS Society to kind of marshal hope. The MS Society of Canada uh, was once a highly reputable, respectable organization that really fundamentally was there for the patient's interests. And uh, I, I've been very disappointed in, in, in their um, lack of um, act activism on these issues. What I do know is MS Society collects a lot of money. I mean, it's in, the, it's in the tens of millions of dollars that the MS Society raises a year. They were very happy to be seen as having a greater bottom line of, of income, but no one got too worried about the fact that the money was actually coming from the pharmaceutical industry. So the International Federation of MS Societies, you know, like more than 30% of their income comes from pharmaceutical industry. They don't talk about it. You try and get it from their annual report and you have to work away at it, at least you used to. 
Then suddenly you've got relationships between the people heading the charities and people from the pharmaceutical industry, all of which, by the way, is behind the scenes. The drug industry and its relationship with the MS Society makes it kind of advantageous for the MS Society to go along that path of talking about drugs, of speaking hopefully about drugs. Then the pressure that should be there from a fair-minded charity person to pressure the whole situation in the direction of finding something that really makes a difference in the long run starts to lessen. And it's all very subtle. So when they start to badger the pharmaceutical industry, then the, the money that they used to give for, you know, MS chapters to have their coffee meetings sometimes dries up. Sometimes the big donations tend to influence what goes on. Drug companies have a conflict of interest. Uh, they run a business, they want to sell their drugs, and they need somebody to promote it. The MS Society is a good vehicle to do that through. Just at the end of 1999, I figured out vitamin D was a major factor. I remember the first half of 2000, trying to get the multiple sclerosis society to tell their members something about vitamin D. Time and time again over the years, we've heard vitamin D referred to as the sunshine vitamin. A Calgary father is so convinced of its benefits, he is giving doses of vitamin D to his son, who suffers from MS. When Matthew Embry was diagnosed with multiple sclerosis, it launched the geologist on a search, a search for a cause. Ashton Embry noticed a link. People in northern countries like Canada have much higher rates of MS. They also get less sunlight, and the nutrient that comes from it, vitamin D. It's totally safe. They have nothing to lose. And they were just adamant. They were not going to tell anybody about vitamin D. That was it. That was the final blow for me of trying to be involved with the Marlboro Sclerosis Society of Canada, trying to cooperate, trying to do things with them. I don't think there's anyone there that, that is actually pushing any, like, a useful agenda. And they abrogated their responsibility for being a kind of buffer between the pharmaceutical industry and the patient population a very long time ago. Well, it was more J J Joan decided, well, we, we got all this information. We should get it out to other people. The charity was my silly thing of, you know, what we can raise some money and get the information out there, get the research done into diet and vitamin D and those kinds of other issues that the MS Society wasn't doing. And we as families with the disease, we need to have those answers. This is now 1996. And the big change was the internet when you actually had more information available to people besides from your doctor. And so you're able to get things out. And so, okay, let's make a website. So that basically was the start of it. My wife has MS. Well, the day I found out, the first thing we did was went on the internet to search for answers. The one website that helped greatly was uh, Direct MS because we were looking for some solutions now, not, you know, wait for drugs or see a neurologist. I called up Dash and Embry and met for lunch and met some of the other board members and my wife decided to go on a diet right away. And uh, to this day, it's been the right decision. Whenever I run into anybody that has, a, you know, a friend or a relative or somebody they know in the early stages of MS, I said, you got to get on my brother's website and find out what the, uh, you know, this is stuff you're not going to get through normal channels. I mean, it's really been helping in people all over the world. I was very impressed when you get these emails from all over the place and, you know, complimenting them and it was helping them tremendously. I'm a scientist. Everything I do and anything I tell anybody to do has to be backed by science. And this is information you're not going to get from your neurologist or the MS Society. 
We did hold a talk back uh, about 18 months ago, and we didn't get much turnout. I think Matt felt bad about that. That night is the first time he seemed to start talking about, okay, we've got we've to do something. And his only knowledge of MS up to then was that he had sat on a... What is our goal then? Our goal is to get the diet and the high-dose vitamin D to the planet. Yeah, no, I agree. You have to hit those. And those first guys who are diagnosed are just being swarmed on because they want them on the drugs. You get that guy on a drug, he's on a drug for 40 years. Yeah. 50000 a year, he's worth $2 million bucks to them, each guy. That's right. what you want to hear, because they're, they're going to have the biggest benefit. I mean, bang, you go on the vitamin D, you go on a diet the day after you get diagnosed. The odds of you progressing are extremely low. Right. But if you don't do it for 10 years until you got a lot, a lot, a lot, yeah, a lot yeah. of problems, well, yeah. so, you know, it's going to be a right. war of trying to, to get these really guys who are first, just when they're diagnosed. Right. That's when the drug comes. That woman there wants hope. My dad has created the diet. He's created the program. He's done all the research. He understands what it's going to take to people for people to get healthy and how to stop the disease. So the only purpose in doing any of this is to get the message out that this is the way. Welcome to MSHope.com. I'm Matt Embry, and I have multiple sclerosis. I created a website called MSHope.com, which is a series of videos and PDFs that give people with MS newly diagnosed or already living with the disease kind of the roadmap to what I did to stay healthy for more than 20 years. <clears throat> MS Hope is Matthew's vision because I think of his, his career. He knows how information should get out to the public. So by taking the information that's on the other site and what his dad's kind of research and putting it into an easy way to follow format is a real gift to people that have just been diagnosed. There are a number of other foods that- I'm not gonna preach in people's face, but all I'm gonna say is, this is what I did. Here's the roadmap, here's the equation. I created the website, I tried to reach the masses. You know, I tried my best. And if that's not good enough, well, it's not good enough. A Calgary man diagnosed with MS is speaking out. To share how he has been largely symptom-free since diagnosed in 1995. If I can get out there and spread the message and even change one or two people's lives, then that's what I've got to do. He's sharing how diet, exercise, and vitamin D has kept his symptoms at bay. He also had a procedure to increase blood flow from his brain. That's right, I have had the CCSVI procedure a few years ago. We're not going to say it's the magic bullet, and we're not going to throw the baby out with the bathwater. The lifestyle has worked so well that he and his father are now setting out on a free speaking tour. My goal in, in doing the speaking tour across Canada and over to London and into the United States is to create as much awareness as I possibly can. Not... You know, this is quite a change from what we've done in the past, because as a family, we tend to be quite private. I don't even know if all of, the, all of our friends knew before Kind of this recent publicity came about that he even had MS in his past. So this is quite a shift for both of us and it's not something that I'm necessarily comfortable with, but I'm happy to support behind the scenes. Mm -hmm. What's that? MS. MS Hope? That's right. When he launched MS Hope, we did have some concerns that I know some of the institutions or bigger societies would have an issue because it is drug free, it is anti the medical establishment. Could they sue him? Could they go after his business? Um, could they go after us, you know, our credibility? Uh, what, what could they do to us? 
I am holding a letter that was sent to me from the Multiple Sclerosis Society of Canada, threatening me with a potential lawsuit, accusing me of an infringement of the Multiple Sclerosis Society of Canada registered trademark. Uh, furthermore, they have a right to seek temporary and permanent injunctions as well as damages. When I started writing about alternative ways of dealing with a MS, of managing MS, this is way back in the 1970s, I came up against the MS Society of Canada. Um, and they were ab more, uh, beyond abusive. I mean, beyond abusive. They threatened me with all kinds of things. Now, had I been a member of the medical community, they would have had me struck off. I mean, there was no doubt about it. They were in for blood. I, I have to admit, I was a little surprised when he got a cease and desist for a website that isn't trying to make money. Please respond via email within seven calendar days indicating your intention to cease and desist the use of the MS mark or confusingly similar trademark. We hope that this issue may be resolved this way so we could avoid further legal remedies. Which blew my mind again, I think. Why wouldn't the MS Society be really excited about, here's a good website that might be of real value and help to be with the MS. Well, it's difficult enough fighting off the effects of multiple sclerosis. Now a Calgary man is finding himself in a battle with the MS Society of Canada. Matt Embry says diet, exercise, and a controversial medical procedure has allowed him to stop taking the usual MS medication. He wants to share his story with the world through a website. The problem is the MS Society says his logo is too similar to its own. He has since received a letter from lawyers and has taken the site down until further changes are made. They're focused on the wrong thing, man. We got a great website, a great responsible website, see, seeking out help for people like myself. We're going to have to change the logo and the color scheme up top in the header. We have to go through some of this content and change that as well. Your video slides are going to have to change, as well as the PDFs. And then we're going to have to put this disclaimer that they're asking for. It's a pretty aggressive letter. They're going to sue somebody for points on an M in the logo instead of curing my disease. The MS Society has sauced everybody because they're all afraid of lawsuits. So, you know, I think you got to stand up to them. They're bullies. Come on. Okay, Jim, noodles under the... What happens is that they, they want to rubbish you, um, and they do a very good job, I have to say. They, they, they've got their Goliath. They have power and money on their side, and they have magazines and influence and so on. And, you know, you're just a, an individual person w with MS. I may have make an assumption it's, it's resurfaced things for Matthew. Matthew's living with the disease and he's living with the fear and the, and the thing of it coming back. So I think that this is again resurface that. And because he's now dealing with this new MS hope site, that's a lot of pressure on him too right now. Well, it's like I have, I have two options. I can just totally stop this whole thing. And that's crossed my mind. Mm -hmm. it's like, fuck it, I don't need to be sued by the MS Society. I don't need to put up this stupid website. I don't need this, right? Nope. And like, it's so out of the bag, right? Like, Claire came home. She's like, telling me about how her friends at school have like seen the videos and stuff. Mm. I'm like, fuck, like this is supposed to happen like 10 years from now, right? Mm -hmm. I think that was my biggest fear going into this thing. Or, or the whole, my biggest fear has been since my kid was born. Mm -hmm. like, how I was gonna have that talk. I feel like I've lost control of this thing again. You know, the first time I feel like the disease took my body. Mm -hmm. This time I feel like it's taken my reputation. I'm like, how have my kids see me? Right? 
And I think truthfully, it's like, fuck, like for me, I know that sucks. Right? And I have to constantly put that kid, that 19 year old kid, who gets diagnosed like right. 50 years out in front of me. I mean, there's nothing stopping you from pulling the towel if you want to. Mm -hmm. I agree. Is that what you want to do? Hello and welcome to mshope.com, a free resource of information for people affected by MS. I have created this new video to address why I believe the MS Society of Canada needs major change to better help people like me and others with multiple sclerosis. I do not believe people give to the MS Society of Canada to hire expensive lawyers to threaten people with MS. How am I doing? Yeah. It's okay. You, you get rushed, but then you think you recover. So. Okay, we'll do another take, right? This is the MS Society of Canada. This is a society that was created for people with MS to defend us, to represent us, and to find us a cure. And given that only 16% of their revenues are spent on researching a cure for MS, I question who this society is truly for. A Calgary man diagnosed with MS is speaking out tonight. He's accusing the MS Society of Canada of not doing enough to fight the disease. He posted a video on his website pointing a finger at the MS Society of Canada's practices. Embry says from 2010 to 2013, of the 211 million in revenue, the MS Society of Canada spent just 32 million on research, only 16 cents of every dollar donated. Well, in the first half of the hour, of course, I was talking with Matt Embry, and he was talking about how he has dealt with his MS. And I have received a number of texts and emails. Thank you very much. But also, Matt Embry was very critical of the MS Society and where the dollars go. So I have invited Daryl Gregory. He's the director, MS Society of Calgary, to join me to give me a little bit of details here. Hello, Daryl. Hello, Angela. Is Matt Embry correct when he looked at the Canada Revenue Agency recordings and found that 16% of every dollar, that's all that had gone to research? Well, uh, no, he's not correct, actually. It, uh, uh, Matt paints uh, an incomplete picture of um, our research investment and our, our fundraising. It doesn't take into consideration the, um, <clears throat> the research funding that we uh, invest through the Multiple Sclerosis Scientific Research Foundation. So what percentage then, with those new figures, would be going towards research? Good question. Good. Uh, I don't have an actual percentage, uh, mm -hmm. Angela, and um, I, I could get that for you, but I just don't yeah. have it, uh, have it uh, with me right. now. Um, but I can tell you, uh, you know, for example, if we break it down to Calgary, you know, and we, if we want to talk about salaries as well, and, uh, um, in last year in Calgary, we our chapter contributed five hundred and eighty-five thousand dollars to research. So, what was that a percentage of your overall budget for donations? Yeah, so um, our budget in uh, twenty fourteen was um, about. Uh, well, to tell you the truth, Angela, I don't. I'd, I'd have to dig that up. To tell you the truth. I don't have our budget for yes. 2014 right in front don't of me. Fucking know. It's um, unfortunate, Daryl, only because I think you knew I was going to talk to you about his criticism about where the money goes and not enough goes to research. So I, I, I don't mean to put you on the spot, but I thought you'd have those numbers. Uh, well, I, I, like I, I do have the overall numbers for research, but I and and services, but I don't have the overall budget. How much goes right to actual salaries and programs? Yeah, it's unfortunate because our my producer knew that I this is what I wanted to ask him. So um, he just had the researching numbers, and I I would like to get more than that. Why do you say that? Well, it's research, but we're giving it to another foundation. That's when people become very cynical of big charitable organizations. 
I'll throw it out there again, though. 7.30 tonight, free conference, Coast Plaza Hotel, mshope.com slash tour, or you can call a number, and don't worry about writing it down. Just go to our webpage. And so it was a big commitment for you to do this. Then you started to wonder, well, the MS Society is supposed to be there to support me. Have you ever um, had the opportunity to speak with them and have them say to you why they don't support that or why they don't... No. Yeah, they don't no. want to talk to you? No. Okay. And this has always been the biggest question. I think the, um, I'm always curious why they haven't called me to understand why someone with MS is doing so well mm -hmm. and getting vocal. Anybody who is still uh, mingling, we're going to give you a, a moment here to settle. I'm sure a lot of people in this room are familiar with Ash and Embry and Matt Embry and uh, the work they've done for 20 years. I think, though, this is the first time they've really kind of come together to share their story. If you know anything about their <laughs> story, you know it's a very powerful story and hopefully an inspirational story. Matt's going to speak first, and then his dad is going to follow up with some of the science behind what they've developed over the years and, and what they hope works for others. And so maybe we could just ask, we'll do the questions after both people speak, please. Hello, everybody. I am so thankful for absolutely everyone for so much of the support that has come to me. Tonight is about hope. Tonight is about learning about strategies. It's about changing your lifestyle and you making the decisions. So this being the opening night is very, very special. But I'm not gonna cry, I'm only gonna laugh, and we're gonna have a good time tonight, and we're gonna get some MS Hope on board, all right? <laughs> so, I'm gonna talk about important strategies to help keep MS well controlled. This is information you're not gonna get from your neurologist and your friendly MS society. I was diagnosed uh, 12 years ago, and I, my doctor, my neuro, said that I would be in a wheelchair in five years if I didn't start on the drug therapy. Um, I changed my diet. I found, was recommended to his diet, so I went and researched it, and I've been doing lots of Googling ever since and found all sorts of things. When I bring this up to my physical therapist or my neurologist, I was met with some dissatisfactory answers. I have fired four neurologists because they all tell me to eat from the four food groups. People in my farming community between the ages of 30 and 50, we are in wheelchairs, we are obliged, we are in nursing homes. <clears throat> and that's not me. What I can't understand, Ashton, is why we don't take on this society where I'm reaping all this money from all these people here for over 100 years. So I agree, you've... you've got to almost have a protest. We gotta, you know, I, I don't know. I don't know how you know we're going to turn this around. That's but... a good question. I will post in the next two days on my Facebook who you have to write. Two days. Okay. Good idea. So thank you very much for coming and for supporting us for all the years. We hope that this really uh, was some great information for you. Wish you all the best. Do you have anything you want to ask? You have to show people, to convince people with MS to do it, you have to show people who are on the diet, like you, who are the picture of good health. You just have to say, this is what you could be like. You could be brimming with good health and having a happy marriage and family and work life and everything you hope to get out of life. But you've got to stick to it, because if you don't, you do not want to see yourself go down that road. So mostly my diet consists of fresh fruits, fresh vegetables, lean meats, and fish. I was diagnosed just at the end, end of March this past year. I had CCSBI. I've been symptom-free for 11 years now. If you get adequate vitamin D from birth onward, and maintain a good vitamin D, the chances of getting MS are almost zero. Posted a photo yesterday of the event, getting a ton of likes. You did great last night, Matt Nash and Embry. After several attempts to get onto the diet, I'm ready to do it now. I've been inspired. Thank you, guys. 
Hey, somebody's posted that right now. Boom. I have so many stories in my inbox. 15 years of remission on the diet, 20 years, no drugs. The people on the drugs got to the same disability level after 15 years as the people who were not on the drugs. I think tonight as a team, everybody, we have to focus on finding secondary stories. This is about different people who need hope. Totally different tone that way. I got multiple sclerosis for the last 35 years. I never took any medication. I just deal with diet all my life. So I've been vigilant, and yeah. here we are. You know, it's been 15 years since diagnosis. Everything's got to go. Milk, yogurt, cheese, ice cream, everything. All foods that contain gluten. I feel so much better. Like, it's been three years now for the, just the gluten-free. By controlling your physical being, exercising, by controlling what you put in your mouth, now you're in control of the disease. I'm just a guy who's diagnosed with MS and has implemented different types of strategies that have worked for me and have worked for hundreds of people around the planet. This has truly become a global issue and a global conversation. Hi, Owen. It's uh, Matt Embry calling around, um, I believe it's 1130 your time. I'm just calling to uh, invite you to a uh, speaking engagement I'm going to have on Toronto in Toronto on September 29th. It's at 7.30 at the Weston Prince uh, Hotel, 900 York Mills Road. Uh, more information can be found at mshope.com slash tour. And I really hope you can make it and uh, learn about my story of hope. Thanks, Owen. Have a great day. Do you enjoy it more now that you're out here? Oh, yeah. Absolutely. Yeah, I, I built this whole thing right, right to the road. Really? By myself. Yeah. It took me quite a lot of time, but there's some nice sunflowers here. But so I, what I tried to do, and some people have noticed it, so like it's got a little slightly different construction. I was trying to make the, the post kind of like, a, like one of those Inuk shook things. Oh, right, yeah? right, right. So yeah, that's I the see, idea yeah. of this. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I can see it. For me, one of the chronic dilemmas has been how much to say and when. I know lots of things that, uh, you know, you'd have to take some anti-nauseants after because it's so distasteful. Higher, how much higher can the stakes be than this? I mean, it's billions and billions of dollars, and yet the system is set up in such a way that, that it can be corrupted easily. It's, it's, it's child's play to corrupt the system now. Uh, nobody's standing up and saying, you know, what they should have said. That's good. We've got half an hour, boys want to be rolling by 3 o'clock. I watched this whole story from the very beginning. Like, I, I, I was one of the investigators that was contacted at the very beginning when the interference trial was planned in 1986-87. And I was the principal investigator of the Serono study with Rebif. I was basically wrote the paper for the first interferon study. And the, 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 I fell out of, uh, out of sync with things when I couldn't get the pharmaceutical industry to do the studies that were really needed, which is looking at long-term outcomes, where you reached a point where something really important was happening, like the development of progressive disease. We, we, we couldn't get them to do it. I mean, I can tell you that, you know, a couple of them told me, frankly, like, why would we do this? We're, we're selling lots of drug. We're making lots of money. The, doing that study can only be bad for us. If it shows that, that it does work, then we'll be right where we are right now. If we show that it doesn't work, we've lost the whole ballgame. 
People accuse me of being anti against pharmaceuticals, but this is not true. If there was a drug that convincingly demonstrates a significantly slow long term progression, I would probably take it, but I haven't seen it. There's almost no evidence that, 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 that any of these drugs make a difference in the long term. What they do very cleverly is leave the impression that it's going to make a difference in the long run without actually saying so. The, 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 that's where the controversy began because when pressure was put on them 20, 25 years ago to carry out the studies and make them longer and reach harder outcomes, let's say time to um, needing a cane to walk, the Food and Drug Administration were the only ones that had the power to enforce this. All they had to do was say, okay, you don't get the long-term outcome, no approval. And there's nothing more motivating from a pharmaceutical company than to tell them they're gonna have their license for the drug jerked if they don't comply. They never did it. I'm not happy, and you shouldn't be happy, and patients shouldn't be happy. I wonder why MS patients are injecting or swallowing MS drugs that may cause serious side effects or even death, but have not been proven to be effective in the long run. It's hard for patients to ask those questions. You know, it's where the, where the physician is, is intended, for the most part, to step in. And if the physician is already you know, compromised because they're on some major drug company kind of, uh, you know, uh, income stream. It, it, sac it sacrifices or impairs their ability to do this well. In the United States, for example, the New York Times had an article a few years ago about how many physicians have a financial relationship with the pharmaceutical industry. It was over 90% in the United States, over 90%. And why do taxpayers around the globe pay billions of dollars for MS drugs that have been demonstrated to have no long-term effect? Follow, you follow the money. You always follow the money. And you find out that somebody who is being relied upon to deliver an objective assessment of whether or not this drug is showing a useful effect is also on the take in a big way from the the institution that stands to gain the most from there being a positive effect, i.e. the pharmaceutical company, right? Get ready, here are the side effects. Back pain, blood in the urine, burning or stinging of the skin, continuous uncontrolled back and forth or rolling eye movements, decreased sexual desire, difficulty with, difficulty with moving, ear pain, fast breathing, irritation of the mouth and tongue, loss of appetite, menstrual pain or discharge or, or changes, menstrual pain or changes, muscle pain, painful cold sores or blisters on the lips, nose, eyes, or genitals, sensation of motion, usually whirling either oneself or of one's surroundings, speech problems, vision problems. Jesus. Uh, so that's Capoxone. It's unbelievable. <clears throat> and then, uh, here's the other one. What are you looking at? <laughs> that's bad, man. Especially if these didn't work. There's interferon. Headache, increased sweating, lack or loss of strength, nausea, sore throat, stuffy or runny nose, unusual tiredness or weakness, vomiting, double vision, seeing double, weight gain. During pregnancy or breastfeeding? No, let's just stop it. It's too depressing, man. Not easy. <clears throat> it's making me think. I think as far as treatment of these very expensive medications go, they do have potentially serious side effects. I, I know that I, I wouldn't be taking it myself. Like, I, you know, I wouldn't be taking it. I just, I'd rather take my chances with the natural course of events rather than introduce something else, which is the risk of who knows what. And the more, the more new or recent the drug is, the bigger the who knows what is, right? Because there's just not enough information. So I think, I think you're perfectly defensible in not taking anything. The MS Society of Canada 
they have never, ever stuck their oar in to this controversy, except, if anything, to kind of diffuse it or deflate. You've never heard from the society that um, these outcomes weren't being met. And you should be hearing it from the society, right? Or they should, at the very least, be supporting people who are prepared to stand up and say this. Is, is, is anyone from the MS Society of Canada here? Pardon me? Anybody? No. No. There's, there's, there's health at stake, there's the interests of uh, poor, vulnerable people, and there is a huge amount of money at stake. I, I remember saying to the, the guy at the FDA, you know, someone shoots you dead for a parking space, what will they do for a billion? And the answer is plenty. But now we have to, we're giving people hard information, right? People didn't like listening about the MS Society of Canada. People didn't like about the sponsorship. And now we're like, yo, maybe you don't like what's going on in your life too, right? That's a different view for someone with MS. And I don't know how they're going to react. Are they going to be angry as hell at me? Or are they going to turn it on the societies and the drug companies? I hope it doesn't come to me. It could come to me. The number of MSers in wheelchairs, walkers, and canes has not declined. It's the odd objective. So, what is going on here? Because I have not seen any convincing scientific evidence that any drug has a notable effect on the long term progression of multiple sclerosis. We did it, man. They're not going to let you keep saying what you're saying without trying to squash you. If you're right and you show them that you're right and you show the world that there's other ways of, of taking care of this without medications and, you know, this whole thing has been smoke and mirrors all these years, you're an enemy. I mean, that's just how it is. You know, when Arnold Schwarzenegger gave me this Lifetime Achievement Award, you know, that, that was the, like the, the exclamation point for me. It showed me that the fitness world is listening and all these young guys that are healthy are looking to me and saying, if this guy can do it at his age with MS, we can do this and we're healthy. So am I, am I doing the right thing? For me, yes. I'm the founder of the MS Fitness Challenge, which is a charity to help people with MS nationwide and soon worldwide to get connected with trainers and to be able to conquer the disease through fitness and health. I've got people with MS from the UK, from Canada, from Australia, from even places like Slovakia that are saying, could you bring the MS Fitness Challenge here? Well, the MS Society has branches all over. Why aren't they embracing what we're doing to say, okay, well, we're doing research, you're doing fitness, let's merge so that we can help you to reach those people. No, instead they're saying, your competition? I mean, where's the heart to help people with MS? I don't take meds, but I mean, I'm not a doctor, so I don't tell anybody not to take meds. I mean, it's stupid. You can't mm -hmm. go around telling people, don't take your medication and just do what I'm doing. But over this time, you know, the symptoms are still there. This side is numb. Like, you could stab me in this arm. I don't feel it. This leg still drags. I mean, I get in and out of the leg press. I put a 1,000 pounds on and leg press it and then crawl out. So I still have all the symptoms. And I eat 
unbelievably well. I mean, I don't eat junk, I don't eat gluten, I eat really, really clean. Mm -hmm. My symptoms have pro progressively gotten worse. Right, right. And this in here is my stash. Okay, so what is all this? Um, these are different types of proteins uh, that, you know, some are vegetable-based. Uh, there's others that I take that are whey-based. And that's what I, every day, I mean, this is what I take in addition to eating all my healthy foods. Right, right. You know? right. Can I judge it right now? <laughs> yeah, oh, yeah, you're going to tell me. <laughs> oh, yeah. They're working on one right now that has nothing artificial in it. I mean, without this stuff, I couldn't get through my workouts. I mean, right. you know, this stuff keeps me... My energy level gets me all the protein I need, gets all my aminos in, the BCAAs. Without it, you know, I couldn't, I wouldn't be able to get through this. I wouldn't, I wouldn't grow, you know? I mean, this, you know, if you look at the protein, you know, the, this one, this is, I think, this is plant-based. Yeah, yeah. You know, it's got stevia in it. Right, right. Let's just cut for a second. And yeah, man, you gotta get off this one. Like, I'll show you that just how it changes your disease activity. It, 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 really? Increases it. Like, wow, because I take whey every day. Don't ever touch it again. So what type of protein? It's poison. It's poison to you. Really? The one, the, the one food you can't have is any type of milk. And I'll show. I'll send any you. Any type of what? Milk, dairy, anything. Uh, whey. Whey is byproduct of cheese. This will. This will. This starts the process. Wow. I'll, I'll send. I'll send you the. Yeah, send me the some science. stuff like a, yeah. I want to read about it. Yeah. But it's just. It's unbelievable to me that we know this increases your disease activity. And nobody says anything. No. Tomorrow we're going to meet Judy Graham. It's a big deal. She's a huge mentor. She's kind of a, she's, in my mind, she's the godmother of MS diet, right? She's the first person who punched out the book on a diet can change your ways, and she's been connected to our family the whole ride up. And my dad wrote for her magazine that she put out for years, and uh, huge inspiration to me. Like, if there's one person on the planet who's been the inspiration for this whole thing, it's Judy. So the fact she's here and the fact we can actually meet her is amazing. So I just really hope she's okay, right? Because how she is is going to be how I think I'm going to end up. So it's been 20 years, man, since I read her book. So I'm still good, but I want her to be good too. Matt, you're the handsomest man to cross my, come into my flat. Oh, no. thank you. <laughs> They're coming in. Hi there. Yeah, so I created a website that, um, it's got four videos on it that kind of tells people how to, like, the diet, exercise. Sure. fabulous. Like, and, like, downloadable PDFs. Oh, boy, you really are the next generation, Matt. It's, it's yeah. so nice. It's a sort of feeling of being a relay runner, mm -hmm. you know. Right. And although I haven't handed any button to you, it's, it's feeling a bit like that because some of the things mm -hmm. you're saying are sounding a little bit familiar. So I still feel that people like you and I are swimming against the tide. Mm -hmm. The tide is mainstream. The tide is give us a magic pill. Right. Let science solve this for us. They... And doing a whole lifestyle thing, it's bloody hard work. Mm -hmm. And how are you feeling? Well, I have got worse, but after 45 years, I should be dead and I'm not. Mm -hmm. That's really what I can say. But for distances, I can't manage without some kind of mm -hmm. mobility scooter mm -hmm. or uh, if someone's pushing me a, a, a wheelchair. And, 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 and it, uh, I'm sorry that it's come to that. It, it's so easy. Mm -hmm to break the diet. Mm -hmm. It's so tempting to break the diet, because it's a hard diet. Um, it's so t tempting to be lazy and not do some exercise every day. My unhappy conclusion is that MS deteriorates eventually. Mm -hmm. 
But I can't say that with certainty if somebody is very, very strict. Because mm -hmm. I haven't been very, very strict. I wish I had, but I haven't. Um, in my own case, I've gotten worse. But well enough to walk around. I mean, you're really, oh, you're really hoping I wouldn't say that, that I've got worse. What have I said, Matt? Sorry. What have I said that's upset you? Well, I think you're probably right. Hmm? I think you're very, you're right, right. That it will have the upper hand. In the well, end. it may not with you. I mm -hmm. mean, I have been, I have been remiss. Mm -hmm. I, I have not been um, as strict as you are, as strict as I was. I've wavered. I've been very human. I've been, um, you know, a, a weak human being about this. And one part of me says, stick to the diet. You know, um, it's the eternal struggle that goes on. Stick to it, don't stick to it, stick to it, don't stick to it. But you wouldn't cry just to see me now. I mean, I mean, no. I don't think if somebody newly diagnosed met me coming up to 69, um, diagnosed in 1974, but symptoms going back to the 1960s, you wouldn't cry, or they wouldn't cry, mm. if they saw me running around in my flat leading a pretty normal life. Mm. You, you wouldn't, would you? No. no. Yeah, given my time again, I would be very strict. Mm. But in my own particular case with the human weakness of not sticking to it, I have gotten worse than I was. And I, would, I wish that wasn't the case. I would really love to be able to say to you, if you do all these things, it will just vanish into thin air. And maybe that's true if you're very strict. Maybe that is true if you're very strict. And, and for someone as young as you, I would say, stick to it, stick to it, stick to it. But you know, maybe one needs the terror, because it's more than scared, isn't it? Mm -hmm. It's terror, you know? It's a terror, it is a terrifying illness. And you see people who are kind of, who've lost it and are gaga and their voice is slurred and they can't pick things up, you know, and all that. And in a way, you, you need the terror to keep you on the diet and exercise regime because it's, it's, if it wasn't that bad, why would you be motivated to do it? You know, it's the terror. I don't want to be like that. I better do something about it now and stick to it. My torso just can't hold me up. I can walk very short distances using two walking sticks, otherwise uh, the short recline wheelchair. Are cognitive problems coming next? Will I be having uh, to face uh, an early dementia? I'm going downhill. Uh, aggressive treatment is not stopping that slide. This is an unpredictable disease. Functions once lost are um, generally gone forever. Then in 2002, my uh, Cleveland Clinic neurologist, she said, you know, I want to check out this work by Dr. Ashton Embry. Uh, he has a very interesting story, helping his son out with diet. Uh, and she emailed uh, the webpage to direct to MS Charity. It was his website that got me started in my food journey. So we didn't have quite as much kale as usual, but we've got some in here. Here we go. Uh, and so we come out every morning and take, a, take out a bunch of kale, add it to our smoothies, or we'll use it for cooked greens. 
So I, I got home, I read through all those papers, um, and I thought, well, this is pretty interesting. So I went back to the internet, started searching, and eventually, it took a couple months, I now had a list of foods that I should be stressing in my diet. Uh, so I had this list of foods, which I now have organized into the green sulfur color. Um, and I started this December 26, 2007. The month after that, I'm driving my wheelchair over to the staffing office. Uh, I take a cane over, and I'm able to walk between exam rooms to see the patients. And I wasn't exhausted. And I also had to note that in that month, my brain fog was just melting away. The month after that, I don't even need a cane. Three months later, I can walk even uphill without a cane. Hadn't done that in years. I don't really know what to think of all of this. I don't know if this is temporary, I don't know if this is permanent, but I, I, I know that recovery is not possible, but I'm walking around. And then, uh, you know, probably three weeks later, um, and I decide, you know, it's, it's a beautiful day, and I, I wonder if I could bike again. Put on my helmet, lay the bike down, step over it, then pull it back up, so okay. And I push off, I'm a little wobbly at first, and then uh, it, it's, uh, <laughs> Zach's cheering, uh, Zebby's cheering, uh, Jackie's crying, and uh, we pedal around the block. And that's when I know that nobody knows what might, what might happen. This really is the miraculous moment when I realize that recovery is possible, and that if I stay on this path, diet and lifestyle, who knows what might happen another five or ten years that I might get better very close to normal or not but the the prescription that it's only downhill is not correct okay we're gonna hit a lot of people with this one this will be very good yeah I think so. creating health is about diet and lifestyle it's not about drugs it's about diet and lifestyle that's what got us unhealthy, and that really is what can restore our health and vitality. You're here alone. Hmm? You're here alone. Yeah, I know. Okay, so just while they're setting up, so talk a bit about this. Yeah, I mean, this is the, uh, this is the set that was used in Field of Dreams, and I shot a film here about eight years ago about W.P. Kinsella, and absolutely fell in love with the place. This would be arguably my favorite place on the planet. <laughs> That's really Yeah, really but it's pretty is. incredible, huh? It, it really is. Wow. The way they preserved it and everything. They've, this is amazing, because it's 20 plus years old now. I know. And where's the, did you see the, there's even the mailbox there, you put the 20 bucks in. Oh, I see, so yeah. you, it's a uh, just donation because I was right. I was surprised when it said this is free. I thought, what? Yeah. What a fantastic attraction! It's free. Right. How can that be? Well, it's just like the movie. So okay. on on the weekends oh, okay. you'll see that that whole okay. strip there. All the cars will come down there, up in there. Oh, of course, yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah, yeah and they yeah. put their twenty bucks in. Everybody plays catch. Wow, that's something else. It really is. They've done it well. They've I agree. They've really done it well. It's it's good to see if they're gonna do something like this do it well. Yeah. And they have. That's very neat. All right, let's do it. Yeah, people are always shocked when I tell them it was from a novel by a Canadian author from Alberta. Right. I mean, this is a story about, you know, a father and his son and keep holding on to a dream. And I think the most relevant thing for, uh, for what we're doing is you know what you said earlier, build it and they will come. And that's what we're trying to do with MS Hope. That we're gonna build it and the patients and the supporters and the people who actually want to end this disease are gonna come.